So welcome back everybody um, to our sixth session of the second BAF uh, summit, global summit. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Professor uh, Dr. Nassim Nakvi, um, who's president of the BBA, uh, and Rachel Muldoon, uh, who is on the BBA advisory board uh, and also a crypto barrister at 36 Commercial. Um, I think we'll start with uh, Professor Nakvi, if that's okay. Um, yeah. So yeah, over to you. Thank you very much. Can you see me, hear me all right? You can hear me all right, yeah? Yeah, fine. Yeah. So, um, hello and welcome. First, firstly, I would like to thank all uh, participating member countries and guest speakers for their contributions to today's summit. BAF, uh, as a forum, has grown from uh, strength to strength starting with uh, 41 countries in 2021. And uh, we have 53 countries now as a part of the forum as of September this year. Crypto assets are um, about to reach a tipping point for mass adoption. And this refers to not just public uh, cryptocurrencies, but digital asset ecosystems in general, including the rise of non-fungible tokens, uh, decentralized finance, stable coins, uh, DAOs, and uh, indeed tokenization of uh, real world uh, assets. And regulators in some countries um, believe they must opt for either some form of reckless innovation, that is regulation uh, without sufficient uh, evidence and facts, or uh, just complete paralysis, as we have seen in some countries, that is basically doing nothing. And inevitably, in most of these scenarios, uh, caution uh, tends to uh, trump risk, but such caution merely reinforces uh, the status quo and makes it uh, very hard for crypto assets to benefit the public in a timely or efficient manner. So I do believe that we are at a critical juncture for crypto asset regulation and policies in the broader uh, context of a global economy. One evidence-based, proactive, constructive policy decision can put a country years ahead of their contemporaries, while on the other hand, one unwise decision can put a nation uh, 10 years behind uh, other economies. Crypto asset ecosystems, as mentioned by other speakers as well today, they are unique because they operate uh, globally in a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer, uh, fashion with uh, teams and individuals who are building these systems. They are often operating in multiple teams and hubs that are dispersed around the globe. And there is fierce demand uh, also for crypto skills both in terms of coders and developers and programmers, as well as uh, strategic leadership, uh, as well as educationalists, lawyers, and so on. And countries often find themselves um, bidding for the same uh, scarce global talent pool. So a country must devise a national uh, crypto strategy that offers uh, flexibility, clarity, inspiration, and guidance to build its uh, crypto economy foundations. And these ecosystems should consist of the following three components, I believe. The first is uh, uh, the 3C approach. So clarity on regulation with uh, unambiguous communication and no mixed messages. Secondly, constructive engagement with stakeholders. And the third is consumer protection giving people uh, opportunity to be involved uh, and invest in crypto asset space, but also at the same time, making sure that it is done with the right safeguards. Secondly, the crypto policy makers of a country must devise a national uh, strategy 
that has a focus on quadruple helix innovation model, as we have been talking about it for some time, also described in the UK's national blockchain roadmap. And this model must be evidence-based and take government, academia, uh, industry, and society and public services into account for a more holistic uh, approach to crypto asset policy making. Um, an example is our proposal of a national crypto asset specialty interest group uh, as highlighted in the UK blockchain roadmap involving uh, Bank of England, HM Treasury, FCA, crypto exchanges, crypto developers, businesses, and industry uh, think tanks. <clears throat> a crypto uh, roadmap must also identify uh, infrastructure needs as well as opportunities for growth at scale. It should also provide a clear strategic uh, direction for all stakeholders and act as a um, blueprint with some focused and targeted uh, action steps. This roadmap must also identify challenges and uh, explore solutions to crypto assets adoption and act as an informative tool to construct the key components and infrastructure of a crypto economy. A crypto asset policy strategy must also provide uh, a fundamental reference framework, an objective and evidence-based uh, resource to support digital asset businesses and think tanks uh, hubs in our country. Finally, <clears throat> we are at an inflection point where uh, technology is moving faster than regulation and hence international collaboration is vital. Platforms like this one, Blockchain Associations Forum, help to uh, provide such opportunities and uh, for transnational cooperation, what I always refer to as a nation's collective wisdom. Lawmaking and regulatory design uh, decisions, uh, they have to become more uh, proactive, dynamic, responsive, and cautiously optimistic. We need to think and act globally uh, to keep up with the pace of uh, digital asset innovation. Uh, finally, thank you very much again to all of our members, external guest speakers, session chairs, uh, for making uh, today's summit uh, a huge success. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Nakvi. Um, great to get a sort of global view on um, on where regulation, particular assets, lies at the moment. And now we have uh, Rachel Muldoon. Um, as I mentioned earlier, she's uh, on the advisory board of the BBA. Uh, and is a crypto barrister at 36 Commercial. So over to you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. It, it's a pleasure to present to you today alongside uh, Dr. Nakvi and all the other esteemed speakers from throughout the globe. Um, as we've said, my name is Rachel Muldoon. I'm a barrister at the 36 Group within 36 Commercial here in London. And in the next 12 or so minutes, I will endeavour to take you on a whistle-stop tour of crypto asset policy making here in the United Kingdom. In particular, I will share my opinion, and it is my opinion, uh, on the successful policy making efforts we have seen to date here, as well as also where there is clear room for improvement. To begin with then, we in England and Wales have a common law legal system. Uh, this means that once a court case is decided by a judge, the principles which are arrived at become law and essentially override previous decisions to the contrary. Now, the benefit of this is that our legal system develops organically and quickly, unlike uh, other jurisdictions where there is something called a codified legal system, as we see in Germany, for instance. Now, fortunately, here in the UK, we also have a body of expert judges who are well versed in DLT and crypto assets. Really then leading the charge is Sir Geoffrey Voss, uh, who is our master of the roles, a senior judge. Sir Geoffrey is a, a champion of DLT and crypto asset policy and legal developments here. And indeed, if one only looks to Sir Geoffrey's speech on smarter contracts in February of this year, 
um, it's plain to see. He says these words, blockchain technology is not something that might happen in years to come. It is happening now. As a result of uh, the flexibility that we have in our legal system then, and also the judicial support, uh, the English legal system has built and continues to develop a world-leading crypto asset framework. And now this means that we are at the vanguard of the latest crypto asset legal developments. As a result, I'm in no doubt that England and Wales is the best jurisdiction in the world to own, trade and recover crypto assets. Now, in November of 2019, the UK Jurisdictions Task Force published its legal statement on the status of crypto assets uh, and smart contracts. And um, as a result of that, the statement called for crypto assets to be regarded as property in English law and also said that smart legal contracts should be considered binding contracts in English law rather than simply code. Now, these two overarching policy principles were subsequently adopted by the High Court of England and Wales in the leading cryptocurrency case of AA and Persons Unknown in 2019. And again in 2020, in the case of Ion Science and Persons Unknown, uh, it then went on uh, and a new spread with the judgments and the principles in the statement, receiving approval by judges as far afield as New Zealand and Singapore the same year. Indeed, earlier this year, uh, before the head of the commercial court, his honour Judge Pelling QC, uh, a decision was handed down by his lordship in Lavinia Osborne and Persons Unknown. And this judgment set down for the first time in the world here in the UK that NFTs are legal property, which can be frozen by way of an injunction where they are unlawfully taken. Now, I was fortunate enough to address his lordship as counsel in the case acting for Miss Osborne. The law is therefore clear in this jurisdiction. Crypto assets are property. Now, that includes NFTs namely the token, distinct from the thing that it represents, for instance, a digital artwork. And there is a potential significant change on the horizon in the form of the Law Commission's Digital Asset Consultations paper published in July of this year. Now, the Law Commission is a body, for those of you who don't know, which makes proposal for changes to the law in this jurisdiction. Now, amongst these proposals, in the consultation is the creation of an entirely new category of personal property called data objects, which would encompass crypto assets. The objective of this new category is to cater for the unique features of crypto assets, which don't quite fit within either of the two existing legal categories of personal property. It's highly controversial, um, this new category, given that uh, the proposal seeks to essentially change property law, which has been long, long established. And it remains to be seen if the proposals will result in changes to the common law or legislative adoption. We'll simply have to see. So Dr. Natvi mentioned uh, predominantly that the need for regulatory changes and a holistic approach. Well, if we can look at it in this jurisdiction, participants in the crypto asset market, be it consumers, vendors, intermediaries, in any jurisdiction for that matter, require certainty, particularly when it comes to the regulatory landscape. Throughout the world, many jurisdictions are in the early stages of classifying types of crypto assets and assessing consumer harms, asking those questions of where, when and how to impose regulatory oversight. Here in the UK, the foundations were set down some four years ago uh, through a series of policy documents which have been published to incrementally refine the regulatory framework here. And the result is that we have, in my view, one of, if, if not the most comprehensive crypto asset regulatory frameworks in the world, which is capable of responding to real time changes in technology. The start came in 2018 with the Crypto Asset Task Force. Now, the task force was 
established in the March of 2018. It brought together those key players, uh, Dr. Natvi mentioned, uh, the then Her Majesty's Treasury, uh, the UK financial regulator known as the Financial Conduct Authority or FCA, and the Bank of England. The task force published its final report in October of 2018, which advocated for a framework made up of three categories of crypto assets. The first being exchange tokens, for example, cryptocurrencies, which are not issued by central banks or central bodies and which utilize DLT platforms. This category is unregulated. The second are security tokens. These provide rights to the holder, uh, such as a share in future profits, and these are regulated by the FCA. And the final category is utility tokens. Now, these grant access to goods and services in the same sense as a conventional membership scheme would, and these are unregulated. The framework was refined again in July of 2019, when the FCA published its policy statement titled Guidance on Crypto Assets. The guidance details further features of the categories of crypto assets and advocates an approach based on looking at the structure and the substantive characteristics of the token, rather than what a white paper may say the token does or does not achieve. Importantly, the guidance went a step further, and it developed uh, and advocated for a fourth category of crypto asset, namely e-money tokens. Now, this category formally sat within the utility token category, and the guidance clarified that these are to be regulated e-money tokens alongside security tokens. It's important to note that while the framework isn't law per se, it is strong guidance and it is persuasive such that a court may rely upon this policy where there is a contractual dispute, for instance, in the field of crypto assets or smart contracting. The 2019 guidance also provides for numerous case studies which are tremendously helpful to participants in the crypto asset sphere in that they look at, for example, the activities of exchanges and trading platforms and wallet providers, amongst others. Truly significant change came in January of 2020, when all new businesses carrying out crypto asset activity in the United Kingdom became legally required to apply for crypto asset firm registration with the FCA. And in doing so, these firms became obligated to comply with anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing regimes, including the carrying out of customer due diligence checks on users for their platform. And to this end, we see the terms crypto asset, crypto asset exchange provider, and custodian wallet provider, all defined within legislation at Regulation 14A of the information on the Payer 2017 money laundering regulations. So in practice, however, the FCA's processing of the registration of crypto asset firms has been far too slow. I consider that the likely reason for this is insufficient resource. And if the FCA is to protect consumers and police those firms who are engaged in crypto asset activity, uh, many of whom are perfectly responsible, more investment is needed to weed out those bad actors. So in a bold move, however, and something Dr. Natby and I discussed the other day, um, the FCA began around this time to publish on its website a list naming and shaming unregulated UK businesses carrying out crypto asset activity. Um, to forewarn consumers of these firms. And indeed, this is something they continue to do today. Now, firms who are engaged in such activity without regulatory approval and registration can be subject to criminal and civil uh, liability and proceedings against them. But again, we haven't seen such action really at scale from the FCA. And uh, one would hope that this will change uh, in support of the market rather than being overbearing towards it with further investment. Now, finally, further evidence of the UK's ever-evolving crypto asset regulatory framework actually came in April of this year 
when the government announced that it intended to regulate stable coins. And, and this is something we're going to see more and more of in the coming months. The promotion of crypto assets is certainly a hot topic. Misleading advertising, for instance, on social media and a lack of suitable information are key consumer protection issues in crypto asset markets the world over. And this has not gone unnoticed by authorities here in the UK. In January 2021, Her Majesty's Treasury, as, as it then was, now His Majesty's Treasury, published its crypto asset promotions consultation response. The response called for the promotion of qualifying crypto assets to be regulated. There are two criteria to a qualifying crypto asset. The first is transferability and the second fungibility, so such that exchange tokens like Bitcoin are captured. I was shocked to read, however, that the promotion of non-fungible tokens falls outside the scope of the protections the government seeks to set out. So in short, most of us would have seen the sheer volume of irresponsible promotions of uh, NFTs on social media. So for instance, the advertising of um, tokens representing digital artworks, perhaps giving rights of a share to future profits such that these NFTs really are security tokens, much like a share or something of that nature. Um, and this has the real potential to expose consumers to harm, which is what the FCA is tasked with combating. Now, that said, the government in its proposal sets out that the promotion of NFTs shouldn't be regulated um, for two reasons. Firstly, that they represent a wide array of different assets outside of financial services products. And secondly, rather dubiously, because they evolve rapidly. I think this is plainly wrong. The near infinite utility of NFTs, uh, and I say that, for instance, because in June I appeared in the reported case of Deloitte and Persons Unknown, where the High Court approved service of legal documents, usually by way of post or email, in fact, by non-fungible token to be airdropped into the fraudsters' wallets. Um, first time in this jurisdiction that has happened, second time in the world. There really is an infinite utility for NFTs. But isn't that a concern for consumers? Because when you look at that alongside the boom in the NFT market in recent years, notwithstanding the crypto winter, there is risk to consumers where NFTs are being recklessly promoted on social media. So on that basis, I would encourage His Majesty's Treasury to revisit its proposals and seek to regulate the promotion of non-fungible tokens, particularly where they are qualified as security tokens. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Rachel. That was a, a very interesting insight into how the UK is dealing with, um, uh, well, particularly England and Wales, obviously, uh, is dealing with uh, non-fungible tokens and, and other crypto assets. Um, and uh, that was a really uh, interesting session, I think. And we will be returning at 1 p.m. UK time uh, with Senator mm -hmm. Ehenian uh, from Nigeria. So we have about 15 minutes break. Yeah. Thank you. 15 minutes break. Great. Thank you Thank all very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.